That day, Christina came to know that Michael came with a group of Christians to visit India and do some missionary work. She almost flew on the air due to the great joy that suddenly filled her being. She forgot about her lawyer, took Michael to a big restaurant, and began to tell him about her miserable life in India. She told him what had happened in her life after he left her with his grandparents and returned to his college. She also told him about her conversion and decision to be a committed Christian, live like him as a nun, and never marry a man. Michael explained to her that she had misunderstood him and felt terribly guilty for confusing her. Then, he told her about his letter which he sent to her through his friend. He said to her in that letter he proposed her and promised to marry her if she accepted his proposal. Unfortunately, she left for India before his letter was hand-delivered to his grandparents. After that, Christina began to narrate to Michael her bad experiences with the Christian churches of India. She explained how she got disappointed by the first two churches she visited in the beginning of her search for a church in Mumbai. The first church she visited was one of those dead mainline Protestant churches, which was called the First Church of India. When she felt unwelcomed and unwanted in that mainstream church she went to one of those fanatical Pentecostal churches, which simply called, the South Indian Ceylon Pentecostal Church. She narrated how she was openly being kicked out of that church because of her Western clothes and was told never ever again to step a foot there. After that, her steps took her to a born-again church. Her real troubles started as soon as she joined this born-again group. Some of the main leaders of this third church convinced her it was a heresy to make such unbiblical vow of celibacy. After that, Christina briefly narrated to Michael her miserable marriage life with Bruno Fernandez and that she wished to get released from him and his selfish parents. Michael told her that she need not stay with someone who did not love her and his only aim was to use her to immigrate to America. He stressed in no uncertain terms that it was unfair to be forced to live with someone that when neither party loved the other. No church had the right to force a wife to live in an abusive married life. He made her to understand that any marital relation, which built on deception and selfish motive, was not based on the truth from the beginning. Furthermore, he convinced her that she would not commit any sin if she walked out of such selfish relation. Christina listened to his advice and instead of visiting her lawyer that day, she asked Michael to accompany her to the American consulate. When they reached the consulate, Christina informed the American consul that she decided to cancel her application for sponsoring her spouse and her in-laws to America because her relation with her husband had been broken. The consulate officer told her that she would lose some of the fees she paid if she would cancel the application at this last stage. She said to him she would not mind if she would get back nothing from what she paid. That day, Christina had officially cancelled her application for sponsoring her spouse, her father-in-law, and her mother-in-law to America. Moreover, she went to the Air India building and cancelled the air tickets that she bought for her husband and herself. The Air India refunded to her full amount without any deductions. Then, Christina decided to move out of the apartment of her husband and rent her own apartment. She gave her cell phone number to Michael and asked him to meet her again in the same seashore that they met. Before she kissed him goodbye, Christina told Michael that meeting him after so long and in a place and a country that she had never expected made her believe she had met an angel in the form of human. On the same day, Christina went to a rental agency at Bandra and asked for a furnished double-bedroom apartment. The manager of the rental office told her that he had a vacant apartment that suited her requirement. She was pleased with the description and paid her advance and first month's rent before seeing the apartment. She then received the keys and the address of her new apartment. After that, she returned to her former apartment. She did not tell her husband anything. She behaved as if nothing had happened. When her husband asked her about her lawyer, she said he did not come to his office due to some urgent work. She said further that she would go tomorrow to meet him. Her husband was a bit surprised by her changed mood. She looked so happy and very joyful. In fact, Sister Christina and Brother Bruno hardly shared the bed together. Their sexual activity reduced to once in two weeks and sometimes one in the month. 
none of the two was interested in the other. Before they got married, her husband told her that he did not want to have a child until he reached America. It was he who suggested she use an IUD to prevent any accidents. Brother Bruno was very religious person. He loved to spend his spare time watching some Christian videos of Western preachers, especially American preachers like Benny Hinn, Morris Cerullo, T.D. Jakes, Joel Osteen, Creflo Dollar, Joyce Meyer, and the like. He would hardly sit and pray with his wife. His wife had different interest. She loved to spend her free time playing her guitar and singing some old spiritual hymns. She also loved to read the Bible and pray. The two were already separated from each other physically and spiritually. They were behaving like roommates sharing the same apartment. Nevertheless, the church forced them to live together as was their custom and their way. After her in-laws came to know about her two past marriages with the old Saudi man and the Bollywood film director, they told their son to divorce her as soon as they reached America. The Fernandez clan believed that since Cristina had hidden her past life from their son, Bruno would be justified in leaving her and marrying a virgin Indian girl. Nevertheless, they hid this secret deal from Cristina. Since their American visas were supposedly going to be issued after two weeks, Mr. Fernandez, Mrs. Fernandez, and their blessed son, Bruno Fernandez had decided to have a farewell party. The party would be on honor of their immigration to their promised land, the land that is flowing with money and honey. Their trip to the United States of America with their daughter-in-law was scheduled to take place after two days from the day their honorable visas would be handed to them. The Happy Fernandez family members booked the biggest hall in Bandra and invited over 500 families from their church for their farewell party. They spent a lot of money on renting the hall and the caterers who supposed to prepare best Indian delicacies for the invited guests. Christina waited until her husband went to work the following day to write him a short note. She informed him of her intention to move out. It was supposed to be the last working day for Brother Bruno in India. He had already informed his boss and submitted his resignation. He went to Nariman Point, at Mumbai downtown, where his workplace and where he worked for ten years, to receive his last payment and invite his boss and colleagues to his farewell party. Anyway, Christina did not tell her husband where she was going and when she was going to see him again. She took her passport and other necessary belongings and left. She did not take a single plate or spoon or any piece of furniture. She just packed up all her clothes, jewelry, carried her Bible, hymns book, and guitar and walked out of the door. Christina did not touch anything belonging to her husband. Moreover, she did not mention in her note anything about her cancellation of her visa sponsorship for her spouse and his parents. Then, she hired a taxi and gave the driver the address of her new apartment. When she reached her apartment, opened its door, and walked in she was shocked. She found it spacious, have two big bedrooms, and beautifully decorated and furnished. When she walked around it she felt as if she was in a western apartment. She then placed her luggage in one bedroom and left. After that, she took another taxi and headed towards Marine Drive to meet at the beautiful seashore of the Arabian Sea her American lover and spiritual friend. Michael Lewinsky came all the way from America to Mumbai to look for his beloved Christina. He took advantage of the missionary group and volunteered to join them in their long voyage to India. He was the only one among the group who paid for his expenses out of pocket. Michael had never forgotten his Christina nor did his love for her grow cold. He waited for her to return, but when she did not come back, he decided to look for her. Her letter had mentioned that she was trying to locate her mother in Mumbai. Therefore, he thought she might still be in India. He had no address to trace in Mumbai. He believed that she would be attending a church and that was where he expected to find her. The moment he arrived, he managed to acquire the local phone book and started vetting the names and addresses of every single church in town. Each Sunday, he would present himself at a different church in hopes of finding her. His search was very slow and for two months yielded nothing. Nonetheless, 
he did not give up and went on visiting all Protestant churches in Mumbai. He did not expect to find her in a Catholic church or an Orthodox church. After two months, the missionary group left Mumbai and travelled to Thiruvananthapuram, the capital of Kerala state, in South India. Michael refused to forsake his search for his beloved and remained behind. When his group left he began to stay in a small hotel at Koleva. He had a visiting visa for six months and decided to use every Sunday of those 180 days in searching for his beloved. His search was not confined to churches only, but it included public places such as buses, local trains, tourist sites, beaches, etc. While his beloved was searching for her mother from slum to slum and chal to chal, he was searching for her from place to place and church to church. If Michael would have to spend six years searching all churches in Mumbai, he wouldn't have found his beloved. The church she was attending wasn't registered as a church. It was registered in the government of Maharashtra state as a Christian fellowship and its leaders were registered as trustees and not pastors. In addition, none of those pastors had been to a seminary or Bible college. No one of them was a qualified pastor or met the Western standard of a church pastor. There was no much difference between the biblical knowledge of a pastor and any ordinary member of that church. In theological education and church history each pastor was having zero knowledge. Anyway, it was a mere coincidence or a real miracle as Michael and Christina interpreted it that the two lovers met at the beautiful seashore of Marine Drive. It was the same shore, her mother, Rehana Khan, many years ago experienced her first kiss by her lover Jamal Khan and likewise it was the same place her daughter, Christina kissed her American lover, the completed Jew, Michael Lewinsky. In America, Michael had never called her my beloved nor did Christina call him my lover. As soon as he learned that she became a Christian, Michael wrote a long letter to her, confessed his love, and proposed her. Unfortunately, when that love epistle was hand-delivered via his church mate, she had already left for India. Likewise, Christina wrote a letter to Michael and revealed her deep love for him, but she mistakenly thought that he had made a celibacy vow before he met her and hence he became an unreachable lover. Nevertheless, she always treasured his love in her heart and considered him her only lover and spiritual friend. In the midst of her marital chaos and the persecution, Christina was experiencing with her husband and in-laws. And the humiliation and rape experiences she went through plus the legal proceedings she were facing in her attempt to meet her mother, her lover, and spiritual friend reappeared all of a sudden and revived hope in her life and filled her heart with fresh waves of love. History had repeated itself again for her, but this time in a new dynamic and in a different environment. When the Somali terrorists had deprived her of her husband and daughter and she lost all hopes in life and became suicidal it was Michael who rescued her. It was her guardian angel Michael, who once again came for her rescue and ready to offer his unfeigned love and unconditional support. But, this time, their love had greater challenges to face. She was no more the free girl he first met. She wasn't a pagan girl or spiritually blind anymore. She became a committed Christian and hence she met Michael's conditions, which at that time prevented him from pursuing his love with her or kissing her. Nonetheless, she became seemingly unreachable again. She was religiously and legally bound by a marriage contract with another man. Michael was very committed Christian and hence he always adhered to the eternal laws of God. He would not agree to touch a girl who was married to another man even though she was his beloved first and continued to love him after she got married. Michael found himself facing a serious dilemma. His bride was ready and willing, but she was married to another man. On one hand, he was tempted to act like Paris of Troy who kidnapped Helen from her husband Menelaus king of Sparta and hence prepared himself for the Trojan War in a foreign soil and against a fierce enemy who used the scripture to support his eternal claim on his beloved, Christina. On the other hand, he thought, he should just considered himself had arrived too late and therefore pack up his belongings and take off and forget about his beloved, Christina. But he already encouraged her to walk out of her abusive married life which she had done. 
Even so, he wouldn't marry her because she was already a married woman. Finally, Michael thought that the only way out of his dilemma and for them to be together he had to ask her to divorce her husband. If she agreed to divorce her husband then he could propose and marry her. That day when the lovers met again at the Golden Sands of Chow Patty Beach, Christina told Michael what she had done and invited him to come and live with her in her new apartment. Michael appreciated what she had done, but he said to her for them to live together without marriage would be religiously and morally wrong. He suggested to her first of all she should ask her church to grant her a divorce. Christina told him that her church did not believe in divorce unless there was a marital unfaithfulness involved. Then, Michael said in that case she should approach a lawyer and file for divorce at the court. Christina liked the idea of getting a court divorce, but insisted that Michael should come and stay with her as a spiritual friend and not as a boyfriend or conjugal partner. She told him that she needed him to stand by her side and help her in her fight with her stepfather and her dispute with her husband and in-laws. Michael wasn't willing to come and stay with her, but he understood that she was still simple and naive girl and she was truly in need for someone to stand with her and help her. Moreover, he was encouraged to move in with her when she told him that her new apartment had two bedrooms. She promised to give him one bedroom and she would occupy the other one. Brother Bruno hid the note that his wife left for him and claimed that she was mysteriously disappeared and suspected that some Muslim terrorists had kidnapped her. To give credence to his story, he lodged a complaint at the Bandra police. The troubles that his wife faced at Mumbra when she went to meet her mother led the police to believe his story of kidnap. The police issued a citywide search warrant for the allegedly kidnapped Christian woman. In less than a week, the Bandra police was able to locate Cristina Fernandez. When the police questioned Cristina, she denied being kidnapped by anyone. She told the police that she moved out of her husband's apartment on her own accord and she notified him on the same day she left his house. In fact, Brother Bruno used the Bandra police to find where his wife was hiding from him. He knew that she deserted him and ran away but he scared that he might not find her by himself since they only had a few days left before their departure date. As soon as he got her new address he ran to his church leaders and requested them to go to his wife and convince her to return to his apartment as soon as possible. The church leadership knew that time was of the essence for the Fernandez family. The family members had no time for spiritual counseling and marriage adjustment and the like. They called upon the main three pastors' wives who were themselves the top female pastors in the church, and sent them after the runaway wife. The leadership instructed the posse to convince by hook or by crook sister Christina to return to the fold. They were told to transfer her back to her husband and to get her prepared for her upcoming trip to the New World. Like the secret police of the Gestapo or the Inquisition, those three women stormed the apartment of the runaway wife. They determined to burn her alive at the stake or cut her tongue and blind her eyes if she refused to recant her heretical beliefs and return to her lawful husband. It so happened that when those female pastors arrived unexpected at the new apartment of Sister Christina they found a young handsome white guy staying with her. They forgot about their important mission and returned to their houses and each one of them informed her husband and then picked up her phone and disclosed the latest scandal to their respective confidants. One of them who were the wife of the key pastor, added some nasty spices to the rumor. She claimed that she had caught Sister Cristina, the wife of Brother Bruno Fernandez, red-handed on bed with a handsome young white man, in the very act of adultery. Consequently, before the following Sunday, every member of the congregation had come to know that Sister Cristina had left her husband and eloped with a white man and that day happened to be the farewell party Sunday. Every believer in that church believed that the wife of Brother Bruno, Sister Christina was living in a shameful adulterous relationship except her husband and in-laws. Bruno, his parents, and siblings believed that Christina did that on purpose in order to obtain divorce on the grounds of marital unfaithfulness. They went to the extent of claiming that Sister Christina had paid a young white man from among the Coleba drug addicts and convinced him to stay with her until she could get a divorce. His parents, brothers, and sisters convinced him not to demand a divorce from his wife on the grounds of marital infidelity. 
Some of the church leaders accepted the Fernandez theory, especially when Sister Cristina phoned the senior pastor and his wife and demanded that failure to grant her a divorce would result in a lawsuit. The pastor told her that she was committing a terrible sin if she approached the unbelievers and sought their assistance. Then, he ordered her to rebuke the devil, kick her white accomplice out of her apartment, and return to her lawfully wedded husband. Anyhow, after the surprise visit of the three female pastors and her phone conversation with the senior pastor, Christina decided to file for a divorce in court. She got in touch with a big lawyer at Bandra Court and explained her desire to divorce her Christian husband. The lawyer told her that getting a divorce in India was a particularly long and tedious process. But, if her husband was willing to sign the divorce papers along with her then it would be granted instantly. A contested divorce for married Christians under Indian laws would require a two-year separation period before the marriage contract could be dissolved. Divorce for the followers of Islam could be granted in short time such as a single-day visit to the court. Sharia law permits a Muslim husband to divorce his wife without the need to go to court. He just has to say to his wife Talak, 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 divorce, 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 and Viola she is divorced. He doesn't require to give any reason for divorcing her. A Muslim wife can never divorce her husband unless there is strong reason such as desertion for long period of time and that too after long religious and legal procedures. Hindus almost have no way of divorcing their life partners. Likewise, Indian Christians have very complicated and difficult laws for marriage and divorce. India is the only country in the world that granted Muslims the right to practice their Mohammedan law, or Sharia law. Christina was disappointed to hear of it and went back to the church and begged the leaders to divorce her from her husband. The eight pastors collectively decided never to grant her a divorce. They told her that she could never ever get a divorce even if she was separated from her husband for hundred years. Accordingly, Christina found herself being locked up forever in a marital jail that no one could set her free from it. She discussed her problem with her lover and spiritual friend but she found him unable to do anything.